Now, I actually uh, rehearsed this with my 12-year-old yesterday, and she was asleep in 10 minutes, so hopefully uh, that won't be the case. Yeah. So thanks for benchmarking that. <laughs> <laughs> so before I uh, start the topic, uh, we all know that we're living in an interdependent world. So uh, there, are, there are events that are taking place in, in Europe, defaults in Greece, defaults in Cyprus. Uh, there are events that are taking place, uh, tensions between China and Japan, the South, Ch and the South China Sea. There's monetary policy being set up in the United States. These global events are, are affecting uh, Indian businesses and, and our lives here. Now, there was a concept a few years ago of something called uh, decoupling. And uh, the idea was that the Asian economies had decoupled from the Western developed economies. And we saw that in the crisis of 2009 that that theory was proven false. There was no such thing as decoupling. Uh, in fact, it was the opposite. We, we have situations where the U.S., uh, to use a metaphor, the U.S. sneezes and, and the emerging markets catch the flu. And this is what we all need to be aware of, is that uh, what's happening in the world, what's happening outside of these borders has at times more of an impact on our lives than what's happening uh, here internally. So to start, uh, when I was a young boy, I liked to collect comics. Um, and somewhere in my parents' house, uh, there is a somewhere in their garage is a box full of maybe some collector's item comics, maybe worth a few thousand dollars today. And, and there was two comic companies when I was growing up. One was Marvel, and their characters were like the Avengers and Iron Man, Spider-Man. We have movies now. Disney bought the rights to those characters. And uh, another comic book uh, a company was DC Comics, and their premier character was Superman. Now, many of you might know Superman, his uh, arch enemy, his nemesis, Lex Luthor. Well, as the comic developed, they developed another nemesis, uh, this character called Bizarro, who we see here in this, in this slide. And you can see he's a mirror opposite of Superman. His S is also a mirror of Superman's S. So he has all the same powers, but uh, the, the opposite side, the mirror image. Maybe not quite as handsome or intelligent, but, but the same. Um, now, Bizarro came from a world called Bizarro World, and it was Earth spelled backwards. Uh, which we see here is a rectangular planet, a square planet instead of a, instead of a round planet. Everything, uh, everything the opposite of, of Earth. And you can see that in Bizarro world, good, good was bad. So this, this child brings home straight A's, and uh, parents are very upset that he brought home straight A's. And uh, obviously, conversely, bad was good. And uh, here we have the convict as the worst lawyer in the world, Mary Payson, and uh, sure to get him the death penalty. And this is considered good. So you're wondering, what, what does this have to do with, uh, with you know, what, what we're talking about today, managing the global economy? And uh, let's look at the headlines from around the world. Here's something from the UK. Now, unfortunately, the blue font, I think, that I use at home is not so clear here. But it says that strong data sparks market sell-off on fear stimulus is over. So strong data, good information, is causing the opposite effect. The markets are, are selling off. And uh, another headline here from Bloomberg, market trades up on weaker than expected jobs report on expectation Fed to delay taper. Uh, so here we have, you know, bad data and, and, and things are moving, moving up. Uh, another one from the Wall Street Journal, um, stocks waver on what is good or what is bad. We don't really know. So we, we seem to be stuck uh, in, in a world of our own, uh, uh, our, our bizarro world here. Now, this brings us back to, to the title that I chose, which is Navigating the Global Managing Economy. And why did I choose Manage? Why not just Navigating the Global Economy? We know that the big, the big elephant in the room is the, is the Federal Reserve of the United States. So the, the Fed is trying, since the crisis of 2008, to manage the U.S. economy, to try to increase the GDP, to try to increase employment. And, and in trying to manage that economy, they are, of course, this is the largest economy in the world, they are having a, uh, a, an effect on every economy in the world, on the whole global ecosystem. Now, you may have heard of the term quantitative easing, uh, or QE. And uh, this is also another way of saying monetary accommodation, which is another word of saying uh, increasing the supply of money, which is another way of saying that they're just printing money. Uh, now, they're not printing money in the old days where you had a printing press and dollars were coming off the presses. Nowadays, they just press a computer keyboard, and they can create $85 billion a month. Now, since uh, the crisis in 2009, the Fed has embarked on a series of these QE programs. 
Uh, now, I've drawn a chart here. Uh, well, first, let's go to the objectives of QE. So what exactly is QE? QE is basically the, the Fed comes up with, uh, with new money, and they buy uh, bonds in the United States. They buy uh, treasury bonds, and they buy what's called mortgage-backed securities, MBS. So in buying these bonds, they're creating an unlimited demand. And, and that demand pushes down the price of those bonds, uh, pushes up the price of those, of those bonds, and, and reduces the rates of interest. And obviously, when you have lower rates of interest, you are punishing savers and you are rewarding debtors because now there's, there's no money that you're getting from the bank, so you are pushing investors to take on risk. And as you push on, investors to take on risk, they put their money in equity markets. They have cheaper home loans, so that spurs housing. Uh, you inflate asset prices, and you, in general, called... Uh, do what's called raising the animal spirits of the market. You create a wealth effect. You feel rich today because the market was up 5%, so maybe you go buy yourself a new BMW or you take your, go to a fancy dinner. And, and in effect, this increases the GDP. So these are the general objectives that they have of QE. Now, I wanted to see what, what did QE do. Um, and, and here's a chart I've drawn of the S&P 500. Now, the S&P 500 is the 500 largest uh, companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So we have Apple, we have Exxon, uh, we have all of the industries represented, the 500 largest. And we see in this chart, we see in this chart that, um, so here's, here's the crisis in 2008, 2009. We, we, we fall off the cliff, we have what's called the Lehman moment, the world is going to end, and uh, we had Mr. Bernanke and uh, Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, under the end of the, the, the waning days of the Bush administration, get together and start this, this QE program. And, and what's interesting to note in this QE program is that once this QE1 took effect, we are moving in the chart from the lower left to the upper right. We are going from here to here. And the stock market in the U.S. during QE, since that crisis, has more than doubled. And, and uh, when they started with QE1, they put together a proposal and they said, we're going to buy this many bonds and we're going to buy them for, for this many months. So it was very defined. And, and when that QE program ended in the white section, we see what happened. We, the, the market just starts to fall immediately. And uh, this is a, a weekly graph. So each of these bars is a week. So we have, you know, quick, quick five, six week drop in the market the minute this QE one ended. So then uh, after that, uh, ben Bernanke in his annual symposium at Jackson Hole went and said, well, we might, we're thinking about doing a QE2. And, and the minute he said that, and, and uh, we see the market, it just starts to take off. And then, of course, he did QE2, and the market kept taking off. And again, the minute it ended, again, it was defined. They said, we're going to do this for this many months. We're going to buy this many treasury securities. We see the market just collapse. And then they did something called Operation Twist, where they changed the maturities of the bonds that they own, Again, they defined it, and this time, even before that end, the market started to collapse. So then they extended it. They said, okay, we're going to extend it. Let's, let's take it a little bit further. And then while it was extended, they said, okay, we're going to start this QE3. And what they did differently with QE3, they didn't define it. So where they defined QE1 and they defined QE2 in terms of a time period, in QE3 they said, we're not going to define it. We're going to run this until we're going to run this. And we're going to look at the data, and if the data is is poor if employment is not improved enough, if the GDP has not increased enough, we're going to keep running this. And if the data is good, if the economy looks like it's going to be okay, we're going to taper this back and we're going to stop it. So this has put us in this, in this bizarro world where every time something good happens, the market sells off. Every time something bad happens, the market says the QE is still going to come, the sugar is is, is coming, we're going to keep this sugar high, sugar high going. So now let's, let's just take a look at what happened on May 22nd in Washington, D.C. Uh, on May 22nd in Washington, D.C., Ben Bernanke had a testimony to the Joint Economic Committee of Congress, and he said that the program, as relating to the flow of assets, blah, 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 he's going to gradually reduce the flow of purchases. So this is prepared remarks, nothing new here. Uh, he went on to say, that any change in the data is going to dictate what he's going to do. Again, this is all known, nothing new here. And then after, after this testimony ended, uh, there was a question and answer session. He was asked a fairly innocent question, and in off-the-cuff remarks, he said that, well, if we see continued improvement, um, you know, maybe in the next few meetings we might take a step down. So this is suddenly, you know, holy cow, next few meetings, he's saying. So we, we've had this QE program that was, that was previously undefined, 
And suddenly in May, Mr. Bernanke says in the next few meetings, we might start to take this down. So now suddenly the market has a time definition of what, when this program might end. And we, we saw what was happening during QE. We saw what's happening to the market. And before we see what happened after that, let's go back to the objectives. Now, the objective is to reduce interest rates and to get people to increase risk. And when the market saw that this QE might be coming to an end, here is a 10-year bond. This is the interest rate on the 10-year bond. We see in May it went from around 1.5, 1.6 to nearly 3%. So the 10-year bond interest rate has gone to 3%, almost doubled uh, after Mr. Bernanke's remarks. And here's a 30-year bond of the U.S., and this has gone up by about 30% from 2.6 to, I think, close to 4%. Now, when, when investors are, 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 are uh, expecting that the biggest buyer of bonds in the world is suddenly going to stop buying these bonds, they're going to start selling them. This is what's causing the rates to rise. You know the biggest buyer is no longer going to be the buyer. They're selling the bond. They want out. They want out now. And they're not only selling the, obviously, the U.S. being converted to dollars, to, to euros, to yen, to pounds. And we all know what happened to the rupee. And I've drawn a blue line on May 22nd at the testimony. And we can see it was pretty much straight up for the rupee. And there's some other graphs there that we'll come back to, we'll come back to uh, in a little bit. Now, this didn't happen only in India. This was not unique to, to us. This happened in Indonesia. This happened in Brazil. This happened in South Africa. Um, and this happened in Turkey. All of these economies, what, are, 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 you know, what do they have in common? They all have what's called a current account deficit. India being the worst, suffered the worst decline. Uh, now, what exactly is a current account deficit? Uh, from Wikipedia, we see that uh, when an economy uh, absorbs, so its consumption, its investment, its government spending is more than what it produces, it requires savings from another country to support all of that consumption, spending, and investment. We need money from, from outside. We need FII, we need FDI, we need remittances from, from NRIs to, to keep this whole show going. And of course, a large part of this shortfall of this current account deficit is our trade deficit, meaning that our imports, of course, are larger than our exports. So let's, let's look at our, our imports. And uh, we see that the green, the green bar, I don't know whether you can see that, the green bar is at around 38% uh, is fuel. So we take fuel, fertilizers, and food, we are at over 40% of imports. We add capital goods to that, we are over 55%. So over 55% of our imports are energy, food, fertilizer, and capital goods. Those are not going to change. If the economy is going to grow, we're going to need more f fuel. We're going to need more capital goods. If the population is going to grow, we're going to need more food. These imports are sticky. Uh, nothing is going to happen. They're only going to, going to increase. Now, they say, there's a saying that the cure for high prices is high prices. So when your currency is, is devaluing, your exports should go up because now they're cheaper. Your imports should go down because now that BMW is more expensive. And, and in August, uh, we had a fairly decent month. Uh, it, it was fairly decent to the extent that the Commerce Minister, Mr. Anand Sharma, said, you know, he's thrilled. Exports are growing in double digits. Our imports are down. We are optimistic. I mean, he's, he's, he's thrilled with the, with the results in, in August. Uh, the currency is devalued. The exports are up. Our imports are down. Everybody's happy. But let's take a look at the August data. The August data shows us that imports are 37 billion, uh, the exports are 26. There's a shortfall of nearly 11 billion dollars. And this is in a month that the Commerce Minister is thrilled about. And if we think about that in percentage terms, we would need to raise the exports by 40 percent in order to come, come to this level. So if we come back to the current, come back to our definition of what a current account deficit is, we need this foreign investment. If this foreign investment doesn't come in because the bar for raising those exports to meet the imports is so high that it's not going to happen anytime soon. So if we don't get this foreign money, this economy can't run. And if we're talking about trying to figure out where is this dollar rupee rate headed, all we have to do is follow the money. You have to just follow the foreign flow of money. That is the, is the factor in this, in this demand supply relationship. If there's a demand and supply for rupees, it is a foreign demand that dictates the level of that rupee. Walter uh, Riston was uh, considered the single most influential banker of his time when he was at uh, Citigroup. He had this quote, capital goes where it's welcome and stays where it's well treated. Now, 
the last few years, I think the government of India has become a little complacent. And uh, they've taken for granted that the growth rates that they were having or that we were having in, in the late 2000s were going to be there forever. And that people were going to come to this country because they were going to come to this country. And that they have not done anything to welcome any capital, nor have they treated it well that was already here. And their policies are going to dictate whether or not the FII and the FDI is going to come back in. And there are a lot of other countries that, that obviously seek this capital, so this is something that we should see what happens going forward. Uh, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. Um, it's also thought to be a curse. And uh, certainly we are living in interesting times. Uh, we are in a situation where there are you know, men in nice suits and ties sitting in ivory towers at central banks, and they are coming up with policies that are affecting everyday lives all over the world. And uh, what they're doing with this quantitative easing and monetary accommodation is unprecedented. The scale of, the, of, of what they're doing has never before been seen. Um, but if we go back and we see historically what happens when, when there are currencies that are debased like this, the ending is never, is never good. So let's take a look at what our risks are. We are possibly nearing the end of QE. So they, 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 they held off last week, we all know that, but obviously it can't go on forever. So maybe they taper in December, maybe they taper early next year. Uh, what happens? Do we, when we saw that graph before, we saw that the minute that QE ended, everything sort of goes in the toilet bowl. And uh, if that's the case, was August just an appetizer of what we're going to get as a main course? And uh, the, the other side is maybe has the U.S. economy reached what's called escape velocity, where it can grow without stimulus. Maybe it has, maybe it's not. And if it hasn't, if the markets do go back, do we see a QE4? Uh, we don't know. And uh, we have elections coming in India. Are we going to attract capital? Is this government going to be able to do anything till the election? Probably unlikely. Uh, what new shape and form takes place? What policies they put into place to attract capital? We have yet to see. So we have a big risk. And of course, we have instability in the Middle East. Um, we know Syria is a mess. We know Egypt is a mess. We know Iran is building nuclear weapons. When one of these places turns into a war, could be any day. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be next month. And if that happens, what happens to the price of oil, which is the biggest import in this country? It, it goes straight up. So there, there are a lot of risks, and, and the risks all seem to be against the rupee, um, if you think about it. Now, Mark Twain said that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Uh, and that's true. In our own personal experiences, in our work, we, we try to do the things that work and we try to avoid the things uh, that don't work. We try to take the experiences of our parents or those who are older and wiser than us and, and apply them. Uh, and history, of course, is not just our own personal experiences. History is thousands of years old and as human beings, we haven't really evolved in the last few thousand years. Our interaction with each other, our emotions, our psychology is basically the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything has already been done. So I wanted to take this lesson of history repeating itself and take a look at the dollar and the rupee. And I drew a graph here of the, of the rupee-dollar relationship since the data that I could find, which was in the 19, early 1970s. And, and we see that, again, it is something that goes from the lower left to the upper right. Uh, now, of course, the rupee was, was managed till 1991, so this was set by the government. And once they let it go, it's kind of been in this channel. And if I use this as the high point, this last devaluation kind of went out of that channel, and now, of course, it's come back in. Uh, and what I find interesting when I look at this graph is that the rupee goes up and across, up and across, up and across, up and across, and this shaded area is the only time we had a sustained rupee strength, and this was in the go-go years of 2003 to 2008, when everybody was talking about Brazil, Russia, India, China, when everybody was stepping over themselves to open offices in this country, when the growth rate was 8 9%. Uh, are we going to see those days again anytime soon? Uh, I don't know. So uh, it seems unlikely the way the economy is going. And, and if that is the case, then it seems that we're going to continue along this trajectory, uh, up and down in a zigzag pattern, but it certainly seems to indicate that if history does rhyme, we, we continue on this trajectory. Now, in this last devaluation, you know, we can see that we went through this channel. So the question then, you know, everyone asks, and I was asked this question a couple of weeks ago by many of the 
members here in this room, is what happens to the rupee. And, 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 and I sent this graph out. Uh, this is on September 3rd I had drawn this chart. And I sent it out to a few people. And I looked at the previous devaluations, and I said, okay, what did the previous devaluations do? How do we judge this devaluation by the previous devaluations? And we see that uh, the last time it made a big move here, and it made a move like this up to here, and then it fell back. It fell back 50 to 60% of the move that it made up, and then it kind of stabilized before the next round. And then it went up, and it fell back around 50% of what it did. So when I was looking at this on September 3rd, I saw we hit 69, and, and I thought, this is you know, completely not sustainable. What is the fallback? So I said, okay, the fallback could be 50 to 60%, somewhere in this range. And I think today we're at 62, 40 or so. So we are close to that target. And uh, these are tools that you know, we can use as exporters to see what might happen. No one knows what's going to happen, but what might happen. Um, Another graph I wanted to take a look at. What happens to the rupee during times of QE? Now, we saw what happens to the stock market in the United States. What happens to the rupee? We had, it's not on the chart, but when, when, the, when the crisis occurred, the rupee went, you know, it went from 39 all the way to, to 50, and then they started QE1, and all that liquidity, all that money came in, and we have a gradual decline in QE1 of the dollar rate. Again, the minute QE ends, we have a pop, 10% pop within a couple of weeks. They, they hinted QE2 on this line immediately, back. Here it is QE2, it's flat. QE2 has held the rupee in place. They ended QE2, boom, again, straight up. This Operation Twist didn't have much of an effect because they were not adding any securities, they were just changing the maturity. And then QE3, again, it's capped it. And the minute Mr. Bernanke hinted that this QE3 is going to end, it just went up like a rocket ship. So we need to be aware what the Federal Reserve is thinking, what they're doing, how they're trying to manage the, pro the situation in the United States is having a very material impact on, on, on our business, on our business here. Now, John Maynard Keynes, a very famous, uh, very well-known economist, you may have heard his name, he was once asked in Parliament in, uh, in England uh, why he suddenly changed his views one week to the next. And he replied to the gentleman, when the facts change, I change my mind, what do you do, sir? And this is just a reminder that we need to stay flexible and we need to stay open-minded. And when the facts change, we need to act according to those facts. Now, last week, uh, the Fed decided not to taper. It was widely expected that they would. And immediately after that, the RBI raised their interest rates. Um, this should be rupee supportive because, because the, the, the non-taper should continue the liquidity flow into the country and the higher interest rate on the repo rate should protect the currency to some extent. So, so maybe we, we, we do come back to, maybe we see a level again of 59 instead of a 6 in front of the number. We might see a 5.9 in front of the number before we again go to 65 or 66. Uh, so this is something that we should, be, we should be aware of. And lastly, my last slide uh, is an old joke. It says, an emerging market is one you cannot emerge from in an emergency. Um, <laughs> And this, this is an old joke that was mainly for, for, you know, for, foreign, uh, for investors in developed economies who were investing in foreign lands. And this is highly applicable to everybody in this room who has any means or any assets. When this uh, rupee depreciation took place, the RBI one fine night changed the remittances for any Indian citizen from $200,000 to $75,000 overnight. So if you had two kids in college, one of them was not going to go. One of them was going to stay in India if you were trying to send two of them abroad. If you wanted to go on a fancy vacation or buy a condo somewhere, that was not going to happen anymore because the RBI changed the rules overnight. And we went in, we were in a crisis in 2009. We suffered a mini crisis, very, very mini crisis uh, just now in the last two months. And we know life is a cycle. There's birth and there's death. There's night and there's day. We are in a period of stability. Stability leads to instability. Instability leads to stability. And we can expect another crisis, maybe not too far away. Uh, maybe there's a financial crisis. Maybe there's a natural disaster. Maybe there's an act of terrorism. To what extent is anybody in the room prepared to get on a flight to some other destination and maintain their current lifestyle? Uh, it's something that we should all think about and maybe take some steps to diversify ourselves not only in terms of our business, 
but geographically diversify our assets so that if there is an emergency, we can emerge from it. Thank you very much. <laughs>